Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number nine, ready for teaching on May 27. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. This lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and is titled A City Called Confusion. Sabbath afternoon, May 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our oh, Heavenly Father, Thank you for what you have done for us. You've provided us your word so that we can have an insight into who you are and what you were like and what you would like us to be, but also that you've provided us insight into what's happening around us. And with the amazing confusion going on around us these days, we thank you that we can have the surety of your word. As we open your word this week, we pray for your blessing on each of us. We pray for our families, for our churches, for our local communities and our ability to witness and show others your love. And today I'd like to pray especially for those who are listening in Monto or Gladstone in Queensland or Bluff or Invercargill in New Zealand or Beth in New Jersey or Joan in West Virginia or Vanessa in Zambia or Deborah in Trinidad or Gordo in Australia or Norlo in Dominica and Joyce in Texas, Clayton Lima. Again, Lord, we thank you for for his presence and for Doreen in the Cayman Islands and for Teacher Gurley Aurelio Bagay in the Philippines. Lord, wherever we're listening on all the great continents of the earth and in the Middle East, we thank you that we can put our hearts towards you and receive your Holy Spirit through the working of your word in our hearts. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Let's read that again, Revelation seventeen fourteen. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. The great controversy theme is summarized in Revelation with the symbolism of two women, one clothed with the sun in Revelation 12, and one dressed in scarlet in Revelation 17. The striking symbol of the woman clothed with the sun in the dazzling glory of Christ is found in Revelation 12. She is faithful to her true lover, Jesus. She is not defiled with the corruption of false doctrines. Throughout the Bible, a pure woman symbolizes the bride of Jesus or the true church. In Jeremiah 6.2, the prophet says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. The prophet uses the expression daughter of Zion or a faithful woman to describe God's people. We'll also look at Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 32. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones." For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And Hosea chapter 2 and verse 2, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. In contrast, the Bible likens apostasy to harlotry or adultery, as you read in James 4.4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
Speaking of Israel's rebellion and unfaithfulness, Ezekiel laments in Ezekiel 16.32, You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. In this week's lesson, we will study these two women of Revelation and probe more deeply the conflict between truth and error. Sunday, May 21. Two Contrasting Systems Read Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 and Revelation 17, verse 14. How is God's church described and what is Satan's reaction to it? Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Revelation 17, 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, faithful. Down through the centuries, God has always had a people who have been faithful to him. Revelation 12.17 describes the faithful as those who keep the commandments of God and those who are elsewhere depicted as called, chosen and faithful, as we've just read in Revelation 17.14. Read Revelation 14.8 and Revelation 17 verses 1 and 2. What solemn announcement does the angel make? And what did Babylon do to warrant such an announcement? Revelation 14 verse 8 And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, and whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. John wrote the book of Revelation at the end of the first century. By this time, the ancient city of Babylon was a dust heap. When John wrote down the messages in the book of Revelation, the literal city of Babylon had been destroyed for more than several centuries. In Revelation, the ancient city of Babylon is taken to be a type or symbol of the end-time Babylon. In the prophecies of Revelation, Babylon represents a false religious system that will have similar characteristics to Old Testament Babylon. The principles that guided ancient Babylon will be the undergirding structure of modern spiritual Babylon. In Revelation 17, 1-6, a woman dressed in purple and scarlet strides across the landscape of time. Let's read this. Revelation 17 verses 1 to 6. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marvelled with great amazement. This woman rides upon a scarlet-coloured beast. The Bible calls her a harlot. She has left her true lover, Jesus Christ. Here, The Apostle John gives us a graphic portrayal of the apostate system of religion that has powerful influence in the world. Look at the wording. This power was one with 
whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication, in verse 2. Drunk? Always a negative in the Bible. And fornication? Symbolic of the false teachings, false doctrine and practice. And so to finish today, both leaders and the common people alike have been negatively influenced by this power. What's our only protection? Well, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Monday, May 22, The Wine of the Wrath Read Revelation chapter 17, verses 1, 2, and 15, and Revelation 18, verses 1 through to 4. How extensive is Babylon's influence? Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And Revelation 18, beginning at verse 1. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. The fallen church system has an international reach, influencing people around the world with her deceptions. Satan is enraged that the gospel will be proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, and that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. So, he employs every possible deception to capture the minds of the inhabitants of the earth. As we read in Revelation 14 verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In Matthew 24 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And Revelation 17 verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Revelation 17 verse 2 continues its explanation of the mystery of Babylon the Great by declaring that she has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. What is fornication? It's an illicit union. It is the fallen church system uniting with the state. In the true church system, the church is united with Jesus Christ. 
the fallen church looks to the political leaders of the earth for power and authority. It seeks the state to enforce its decrees. Rather than drawing her strength from Jesus as her true head, she looks to the state for support. Revelation 17 verse 2 continues its dramatic portrayal, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The symbolism of the pure juice of the grape is used throughout the New Testament to represent the untainted pure blood of Christ poured out for our salvation on the cross, as we see described in Matthew 26, 27-29. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins." But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In Luke twenty-two twenty, Jesus says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. When the pure new wine of the gospel is distorted and the teachings of the word of God are replaced with the teachings of human religious leaders, it becomes the wine of Babylon. We read in Matthew 15 verse 9, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Notice too that God calls his people out of Babylon. In other words, no matter how corrupt and evil the system is, its reach is so wide that it encompasses, at least for a certain time, his faithful ones, or my people, as it says in Revelation 18 verse 4, as he calls them. Yet the time is coming when God will call them out of that corrupt and evil system, which is about to fall because of its corrupt and evil nature, this dwelling place of demons and cage of every unclean and hated bird, as it says in Revelation 18 verse 2. And so to finish today, what role do those who proclaim the three angels' messages have in being used by God to call my people, his people, out of Babylon. Tuesday, May 23. Mystery Babylon the Great. Read Revelation 17, verses 4 to 6. What do these verses teach us about the nature of this evil system? Revelation 17, beginning at verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marvelled with great amazement. As we have seen, Revelation 17 describes an apostate religious system that introduces into Christianity many of the teachings of Old Testament Babylon. Once again, we have a comment from the unpublished manuscript, page 43, The Closing of the Cosmic Conflict, Role of the Three Angels' Messages by Angel Manuel Rodriguez. It reads, In order to search for an understanding of the nature of Babylon, we need to go back to its first reference in the biblical record in Genesis. It all began on the plain of the land of Shinar, a region in the southern part of Mesopotamia, today South Iraq, called Babylonia. It is there that the Tower of Babel was built, a symbol of human self-sufficiency, self-preservation and independence from God. End of quote. And the reference is to Genesis 11 verses 1 to 4. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Tower of Babel, 
the site of ancient Babylon, was built in direct defiance to the word of God. The Babel builders built this monument for their own glory and God confused their languages. The Genesis account put it this way in Genesis 11 verse 9. Therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. So evil is this system that it is depicted as having been drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus in Revelation 17 verse 6. Horrific images of just how corrupt Babylon is. And we're also referred here to Isaiah 49 and verse 26. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Saviour and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. In essence, spiritual Babylon represents a religion based on human teachings, established on human ideas, and supported by human traditions. It is a form of human-made religion built by perhaps brilliant human religious leaders, but it stands in opposition to the power of the gospel in the church that Jesus built, a church built on love, not violence. The book of Revelation describes these two systems of religion. The first reveals total trust in Jesus and dependence on his word. The second reveals trust in human authority and dependence on human religious teachers. One is a Christ-centred faith with total dependence on Christ's grace, sacrifice and atonement for salvation. The other is a humanistic approach to faith that replaces the total dependence on Christ for salvation with the dependence on the traditions of the church. And so to finish the day, how can we protect ourselves from the subtle influences of Babylon, such as the tendency, easy as it is, to depend upon ourselves and not wholly upon God? Wednesday, May 24. A call to commitment. Revelation's appeal is an urgent call to commitment summarised in the symbolism of the two women in Revelation. Although at times it will appear that God's people will be defeated in this cosmic controversy between truth and error, God promises that his church will triumph in the end. Compare Matthew 16.18 and Revelation 17.14. What promise did Jesus give his disciples regarding his church? Matthew 16 and verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In Revelation 17, 14, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Christ is the solid foundation his church is built upon. His church is based on the teachings of his word and guided by his spirit. On the contrary, Babylon, as we have seen, is rooted in human-made traditions and teachings. Any religious leader who substitutes human opinions or traditions in the place of or above the revealed will of God in the scriptures is simply fostering Babylonian confusion. In the days of ancient Babylon, church and state were one and the same thing. When King Nebuchadnezzar sat in his temple on his royal throne, he supposedly spoke for the gods. On one occasion, as an act of defiance toward the true God, the Babylonian king passed a universal decree enforcing worship and commanded all his subjects to bow to his decree, a powerful symbol of what God's faithful people who refused to worship the false image will face in the last days. And we're referred to Daniel chapter 3. Let's read the whole story because this is very exciting. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators and the governors, 
the councillors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So... At that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp and lyre in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations and languages, fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live for ever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery in sympathy with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So they brought these three men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery and sympathy with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated, and he commanded certain mighty men of valour who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. 
Then Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors and the king's counsellors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. In the last days of earth history, a church-state system will arise, spiritual Babylon, with a spiritual leader claiming to speak as God. His word will be declared to be the very word of God, and his commands the commands of God. Throughout the centuries, the Roman pontiffs have declared that they stand in the place of God on earth. In his encyclical letter of June 20, 1894, Pope Leo XIII stated, We hold upon this earth the place of Almighty God. The Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary adds, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but, as it were, God and the Vicar of God. End of quote. The Apostle Paul adds these words exposing this power, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. And so, to finish today, because we've already seen that God has faithful people in Babylon, why must we be careful in how we talk about it, and why must we be careful not to judge people as individuals as opposed to the system itself? Thursday, May 25, Babylon, the centre of idolatry. Here is another clue in clearly identifying the mystery of Babylon the Great. Idolatry was at the heart of Babylonian worship. Read Jeremiah 50, verses 30 to 38, and Jeremiah 51, verses 17 and 47. What do you discover in these verses about ancient Babylon's worship of images and God's response to it? Jeremiah 50, beginning at verse 33. The children of Israel were oppressed along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon and against her princes and her wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers, and they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men, and they will be destroyed. A sword is against their horses, against their chariots, and against all the mixed people who are in their midst. And they will become like women. A sword is against her treasures, and they will be robbed. A drought is against her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. In Jeremiah 51 verse 17, everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by the carved image, for his moulded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in him. And verse 47, Therefore behold, the days are coming, that I will make judgment on the carved images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be ashamed, and all her slain shall fall in her midst. Jeremiah 50 and 51 predict Babylon's destruction by the Medes and Persians. One of the reasons for Babylon's demise was its idolatry. 
The Babylonians believed that these images were representations of their deities. In Babylonian religion, the ritual care and worship of the statues of deities was considered sacred. The gods lived simultaneously in their statues in temples and in the natural forces they embodied. The pillaging or destruction of idols was considered to be loss for the people of divine patronage. For example, the Chaldean Prince Marduk Apla Edina II fled into the southern marshes of Mesopotamia with the statues of Babylon's gods to save them from the armies of Sennacherib of Assyria, says Jane R. McIntosh in Ancient Mesopotamia, New Perspectives, page 203. The Bible prophets contrasted the worship of these lifeless images with the Creator God who is both alive and and life-giving. As we read in Jeremiah 51, verse 15 and 16, He has made the earth by His power, He has established the world by His wisdom, and stretched out the heaven by His understanding. When He utters His voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapours to ascend from the earth from the ends of the earth, and makes lightnings for the rain. He brings the wind out of their treasuries. And verse 19, The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Read Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, and Psalm 115, verses 4 to 8. What do they teach about idolatry. First of all, Exodus 20, beginning at verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And Psalm 115, beginning at verse 4, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Though the issue of idolatry of spiritual Babylon goes deeper than just bowing before images of wood and stone, spiritual Babylon does parallel ancient Babylon with the images introduced into its worship service. The use of images as objects of worship or so-called veneration is a violation of the second commandment because it limits the ability of the Holy Spirit to impress upon our minds the things of eternity and reduces the majesty of God to a lifeless statue. These images were introduced into Christianity in the 4th century to make Christianity more acceptable to the pagan populace. Unfortunately, these images are often given the sacredness and homage that belongs to God alone, which makes the whole thing spiritually degrading. Friday, May 26. From the Great Controversy, page 383, we read... The message of Revelation 14, announcing the fall of Babylon, must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt. Since this message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore it cannot refer to the Roman Church alone, for that Church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. End of quote. Daniel 3, the story of the three Hebrews who had been ordered to worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up in Daniel 3.5 in ancient Babylon, stands as a symbol, a model of what will happen when spiritual Babylon in the last days will enforce worship of a false image as well, as we read in 
Revelation 13, verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast be killed. And Revelation 14, verse 9, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark or his, on his forehead or on his hand, and verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. And Revelation 16, verse 2, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. And Revelation 19, verse 20, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped the image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. How interesting that the commandment that the three Hebrews would have violated had they obeyed the king, the second commandment, as we saw in Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5, was one of the two commandments that this power depicted in another place as seeking to change times and laws in Daniel 7.25 had tampered with. What was the other commandment it tampered with? Of course, the fourth commandment, which, as we have seen and will see again, sits at the heart of the whole question of worship, and will be central in the final crisis when we face the question of whether we will worship the one who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, or the beast and his image, as depicted in Exodus 20 verse 11, and reiterated in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week, and there are four. Number one, what relationship does the Tower of Babel have to modern spiritual Babylon? What are the similarities between the two? Two, how do you harmonize two contrasting ideas? Jesus has given authority to his church, but it is dangerous to place our religious experience in the hands of any spiritual leader. What are the limits of church authority? Three, how can we learn that idolatry, one of the sins of Babylon, isn't just bowing down to statues? In what ways can even Protestants fall into idolatry? And four, what are some other parallels you can find between Daniel 3 and the forced worship there, and what we have been warned about in the last days? And here's Sibylla with Inside Story. Thank you, Sibylla. Bike and Bible, Part 1, by MB, as told to Kathy Lichtenwalter. I wish you could meet Hussein, the security guard for the building where my wife and I live as missionaries in the Middle East. From the time we first met, we could see he observed his faith carefully and lived with sincerity. I liked him. Hussein visited our home many times and he invited us to his as well. We often conversed about the simple things in life and even sometimes about spirituality. At our initiative, he graciously joined us in prayer. As our friendship grew by God's grace, we sought to take a new step in our friendship. We began to pray for the right moment to give him a Bible. One day, I noticed that Hussein was upset. 
he impatiently explained that his bicycle, his only transportation to work, had been stolen. He was preoccupied with trying to find a bicycle to borrow. That's the day that I began praying for a bicycle for my friend. Several months had passed and we received an unexpected gift of 40 US dollars. I was puzzled. It seemed like God had sent the money directly from heaven. As I was praying a short time later, the distinct thought came to me. Show Jesus to your friend, buy a bicycle for Hussein. I set aside the $40 and began adding to it. But the country's economy worsened by the day, and no matter how much money I saved, I did not seem to have enough to buy a bicycle. But I kept praying and saving. I also went to many second-hand bicycle shops. I began imagining what it'd be like to give Hussein a bicycle for his birthday. When Hussein's birthday came, my wife baked a cake. I planned a special menu and we invited him for supper at 5.30pm. Certain that God could still answer with a miracle, I went out looking for the bicycle that we had prayed about for so long. At 5pm I returned home, unsuccessful and discouraged. My wife reminded me that God knew how much we wanted to help and had prayed. He's taken care of the situation, she said. The supper was a perfect surprise. Hussein was delighted. He told us how he blessed he was to have us in his life. We enjoyed the meal together, presented him with the cake and had a special prayer for him, thanking God for his life. But we had no bike, no gift. The next day, still searching for a second-hand bike, I was startled by an online post indicating that a Russian man had listed a bicycle for sale only 10 minutes earlier. I couldn't believe the price, the photo and the condition of the bicycle. I grabbed my phone, contacted the owner and even bravely asked for a discount. The deal was made. As I lifted the bicycle into my car, I knew God had answered our prayers. The bicycle had cost the exact amount that I had saved over many, many months. The mission story concludes next week. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.